when they bought a piece of property, a shuttered winery, and a home. And they brought their three young children with them and uh, basically started to sell grapes because that's all they could do in the middle of prohibition during that dry time. Luckily, heads of households could make 200 gallons of wine at the time. And so they were able to keep the vineyard going. And uh, we w outweighed it, uh, went through the Great, started with the Great Depression and, and launched into repeal, dusted off the equipment and went into the winemaking part of the business. So. We have uh, the first vineyard here was established in the early 1900s before we brought the property, bought the property. And uh, the, so they, they were the first generation, Giovanni and Julia, and um, followed by the second generation, which included my uncle John Petroncelli and my dad Jim Petroncelli. And um, they um, were basically grew up at the winery. My dad was the only, the fourth and the youngest of the kids, so he was born at the winery. The office he's sitting in is his former family home, and it's also where I grew up. And uh, and so the second generation made their way um, by working in the vineyard, working in the winery, and then working out in the market. Uh, my uncle John taking the lion's share of the winemaking years, and my dad developing our sales and marketing network. So I'm going to introduce my dad, Jim. Uh, he is going to tell you a little bit about the Chardonnay, which I hope you have in your class which I do, cheers. And so he's going to um, talk a little bit about what this means to us and our history with Chardonnay um, over the years. So dad, go ahead. Okay, Julie, hey. welcome, uh, welcome to my old bedroom. This is uh, actually my dad, I took out my bed and put a desk in and I'm, I'm in the same room here. So uh, just uh, to show our family hasn't gotten too far away from uh, our roots here. Anyway, uh, just a little bit about uh, the Chardonnay uh, we've been making for uh, oh, uh, ooh, close to 50 years now, 45 years. And uh, uh, we've grown it in, um, in, at one time we grew it on, on our own vineyard here uh, surrounding the winery. Uh, but then again, this is a little warmer climate here. So we've, we've moved uh, some of the grape production to some friends, growers, uh, down uh, down Dry Creek Valley. Uh, actually, uh, one of the early growers, uh, Frank Johnson, uh, borders the Russian River uh, Appalachian, oh, which is a little bit cooler and serves uh, serves the production of Chardonnay a little bit a uh, little bit better than the uh, surrounding vineyards here at the winery, which is a little bit warmer climate, hillside, uh, more more adapted to uh, Zinfandel and Cabernet Sauvignon. So uh, uh, we've continued with uh, with the Johnson Vineyard as one of our prime uh, producers. Uh, the grapes there, the cooler climate tends to bring out uh, the acidity a little more uh, to a little higher level, and which makes the wine crisper, a little bit more uh, a little more apple uh, to it. And uh, uh, I think it, it's it's actually uh, the best part of the Chardonnay is, is growing in that, that particular vineyard. And uh, so um, that's kind of the vineyard history. Uh, and then uh, as far as the winemaking goes, uh, uh, we've gone through uh, some changes through time, but uh, primarily we end up uh, uh, partial barrel fermentation, uh, partial malolactic, uh, and then that gets back into the, gets blended back into the the uh, cold fermented uh, Chardonnay. So it maintains uh, the acidity and the crispness in the wine and yet gives it a little bit of complexity and uh, layers of flavor with the uh, slight amount of oak aging. Uh, and so uh, I think it, it makes a very balanced, uh, balanced Chardonnay and uh, that's what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we, we, and we still can uh, uh, with our long history with the growers and in our own production, we're able to maintain some nice pricing on the wine, which uh, brings out some, some great values. So anyway, um, I'm going to taste some of it right now, if anybody wants to join me, and we'll see, uh, see how it all worked out. Yep, I, uh, it was exactly as I thought it was going to be, uh, crisp and and flavorful lingering on the palate. And uh, I think it's a nice example of the wine. It goes great with foods. Uh, 
sip it by itself. I'll, I'll probably drink the rest of it a little later on. So uh, um, it, I won't waste any of it. So anyway, Jim, you guys make um, a, you guys make a couple uh, different Chardonnays. Uh, stylistically, what are you uh, what are you aiming for for the different ones? Yeah, we, we do make actually we make a uh, a single vineyard Chardonnay uh, Frank jo from the Frank Johnson Vineyard, uh, and we do a little different style that's 100% uh, barrel fermented, and uh, so it, in small small oak, and uh, so we, again it brings out the 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 oak character. It, it then goes through malolactic, which gives it a little bit of the butter, and so it's, it it is. Even though it's from basically the same grapes, creates some different flavor components that the the winemaker can bring out by doing some different style of uh, of winemaking. So so it, it just uh, many people think oak is the great flavor of uh, of Chardonnay, and so uh, uh, we we bring that out more in the Johnson single vineyard, and then yet in our own regular uh, signature selection we get the a little more of the crispness and. Uh, uh, maybe a little bit more uh, of the trend of, away from heavy oaking, but uh, but there's something to be said for for some good barrel fermentations uh, stored on uh, leaves, steering of the leaves. So uh, uh, you know, adds complexity, and uh, that's what we're trying to do. So. And and then you add you add to that one the uh, the stainless steel, the all the unoaked, and so then you have the, the best of all three worlds, where you have the bright, beautiful, crisp apple. You have the one with the apple and the complexity, and then you have the nice barrel ferment um, on its own. So it's a really a nice array of Chardonnays. Great opportunity to plug the brand new product. <laughs> <laughs> Always be branding. Always. <laughs> I've never done so much drinking at my computer. At least that's what I tell my wife. <laughs> I was going to say that's what I tell my boss, but uh, Josie yeah. oh, is in California yeah. now. So. <laughs> So All right. anyway, well, that's uh, what we continue to do. Well, I, I do love Jim that you are that you referred to your office as your uh, the room you grew up in, and yeah. uh, it's absolutely hysterical that uh, at your age you're being sent to your room again. <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, that's happened before along the way, so uh, <laughs> I'm anyway, guessing it won't be the last time. It, it go it's good to be able to uh, have a room to go to. So <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Anyway, all great. All right. So thank you, Dad. That was great. Okay. All right. So just to fill in a little bit more about the second generation and how all of that rolled over the years, uh, my uncle John became winemaker in 1948. Uh, my dad uh, came along in the mid-50s, being the younger brother by seven years. And um, by 1963, they had purchased the winery from their parents. So my grandparents retired not too far from here, just down at the vineyard house. And uh, John and Jim started a whole new uh, chapter of Pevincelli. Uh, that included expanding the varietal line from those early uh, blends that my grandparents made. And uh, it also included finding the right spot, planting the right grape in the right spot. Uh, I'll use the Chardonnay as an example. We had Chardonnay planted up here at the north end of the valley. A little bit too warm for Chardonnay. So Cabernet Sauvignon is happily planted in its spot. So John, um, as vineyard manager, uh, made sure that each of those grapes that we, when we replanted, went in and it was the right grape for the right spot. And that's the beauty. Uh, Monse, our winemaker, often refers to uh, very varietally correct. Each of our wines, you will find the, there's no doubt it's Chardonnay, there's no doubt it's Sauvignon Blanc. Each of those are all very varietally correct. And so that is part of a style that John began and that our current winemaker, Monse, who I'll introduce a little bit later on, um, is following. So um, what I'll do is now introduce, um, I'll talk about the fourth generation in a little bit because we're going along numerically, uh, but uh, Mitch Blakely, fourth generation family member, uh, we'll t now talk about our Sauvignon Blanc. And I hope you have that one in your glass right now. And um, go ahead, Mitch, and uh, give us the story. Absolutely, Julie, thank you. So like she said, um, my name is Mitch Blakely, I'm a fourth generation Ben and Shelly family member. Um, my mom is Lisa, uh, one of the four daughters. And uh, my dad is Lance Blakely. Uh, if you've had a chance to meet him along the way. Uh, he is the vineyard manager now uh, at the uh, for Pet and Jelly Vineyards. 
and I've worked under my dad since I was about 12. I want to say 12 or 13 years old. I started working uh, part-time uh, in the summer, uh, just when I was out of school, and that continued on through college. Uh, after college, I came home, and uh, I think I graduated on a Friday, and I started work on Monday. So <laughs> there was uh, there was no uh, relaxing after. You after got the whole week. weekend off. God. Whole weekend, yeah, it was great. Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe I got a three day weekend. I think graduation was pretty much just I walked for forty five minutes or did the you know did the ceremony, and then I had that day off too. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, and. Predominantly, what I've what I've done uh, at the winery with my first five years uh, working here full time is working in the vineyards production side. Um, I know I'm fortunate enough to, during harvest, kind of float into the cellar and work with Monse and the production team as well. But uh, predominantly, uh, vineyards and, and production overall. And uh, with our Samuel Blanc vineyards, um, I was. Um, I was able to present this wine um, just with uh, my experience with it. Uh, I think uh, we, I think uh, we have 12, 12 acres. Sorry, there's some half acre blocks and whatnot. I had to had to think about that for a second, but uh, we have twelve acres of it. Uh, I think what's unique about our Savion Blanc is we have split uh, vineyard system um, and how we grow it. And I think it's a nice combination when it all comes together. You have kind of a, a best of both worlds scenario with our Savion Blanc. We have kind of the nice, bright, crisp, refreshing flavor that you want in a, a summer wine. Uh, that's what it's designed to be. It's, you know, a drink now, um, easy drinking, very approachable, uh, bright, crisp, uh, bridal, but also has kind of a tropical fruit aspect, um, some citrus, a little bit of a melon flavor to it. Um, so these are all things that I really appreciate in this wine because um, I associate with uh, the taste that I that I taste out in the vineyard. Uh, this is one of those varietals that it, it translates really well to the bottle. Um, you know, we uh, have one of these blocks set up where we have it on a vertical cordon system and we get it exposed to sun as early as possible. So after after berry set, um, we have a tucking system where we have it on a wire and we push all the canopy above the fruit zone. That way, early on before, way, much, way before beration, we get these berries exposed to the sun. They get sort of acclimate, acclimated to the sun and that block really gives us kind of the tropical aspect, I believe. It, it comes in a little bit, a little bit riper than the other block, which is sort of a it's a cordon but it's not trained vertically it's sort of all over the place it's not there's no <laughs> necessarily um, system to it whatever is the healthiest arm we sort of promote and and train whichever direction it it, it so pleases in turn that gives it a little bit more of a canopy a little bit more of a shaded um, shaded look for the for the, the fruit that's set in there and that gives us more like the bright acidity, um, a little bit more of the green flavors that uh, you might taste in this in this Sauvignon Blanc. So I kind of like working with both sides of it. I mean, soil profiles. I mean, the, these blocks are very close in proximity. So soil type, there's not much different. It's a sandy loam. It's down along the creek where it's you know kind of coolest. Of, you know, I know Dry Creek's a, a warmer region than Russian River Valley or some. Appalachians further south from us, but it's the coolest place that we have, and um, I just think it's it's just a nice combination of all all of that put together. So, another thing about Savion Blanc as well, um, I kind of skipped over the, the history of it um, here at Petrincelli. I think I skipped over it because I haven't been part of much of that history. <laughs> uh, I know this is you know before my time, but. Um, from what I can recall from what my dad has talked about, you know, in the early 90s, uh, I think there was that transition from, you know, there was like Chardonnay and some other white varietals grown in, in the area. But uh, I think sort of as the wine industry progressed, there was a little bit more fine tuning with the areas. You know, I know Chardonnay can grow in this area, but it's a little bit, you know, 
higher quality, maybe further south, or it's, it's easier to grow in a little cooler region. So I think Samuel Blunt came into play in, you know, 93, 94 here for us specifically, but around the area, probably late eighties, early nineties. And it was one of those where I think Dry Creek Valley didn't have really a white wine, you know, uh, like Russian river had Chardonnay. It was, it wasn't so definitive. And I think, I think, um, that was one of the first blocks that my dad helped replant in Dry Creek is the Savion Blanc. It was, um, from 91 till 98, they did uh, a full replant of the Dry Creek Ranch. And I think this was one of the first. And, uh, yeah. I think, uh, it's been very consistent overall. Uh, I mean, I'm, I know you guys have a much better tune on the market than, than, I, than I do, but uh, it always seems to be a, a very popular varietal uh, year in and year out. I know that trends sort of go up and down, but this one, I, I believe, stays fairly steady. And that's another reason why I love Savion Blanc. All right, so any questions about the Sauvignon Blanc out there? I know it's, yeah, it's always a favorite and it always just showcases. In fact, I was trying to remember what was in its spot when they replanted it. Was it Gewürztraminer or Riesling? Dad would have to, to remind me which one was down there before they planted the Sauvignon Blanc. I think it was the, uh, well, it was actually both of them, Gewürz and Riesling, and we just uh, converted uh, both of those over to uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Ah, good. Thanks. All right. So um, the next portion is just talking about my generation. Uh, the third generation joined uh, the fun, uh, starting with my sister Lisa, who is Mitch's mom. Uh, she was the first of us uh, to kind of branch in, and my cousin Richard followed, and then I followed, and then my sister Kathy, Lisa, and Joanna all have worked, we've all worked together here at the winery at one time or the other. And uh, then of course, later on, husbands joined us, Lance, uh, who is our vineyard manager and, and uh, operations manager. And then my husband, Ed, joined about, I don't know, has it been 15 years now, hon? And uh, so uh, that's, that's the third generation. And what we, what we were able to either help access is help to develop the line a little bit more um, we, we basically remain true to the roots of what uh, John and Jim had started. Um, a big hats off to both the first and the second generations, of course, for laying that wonderful foundation. And then, of course, we were just able to build on that. And that is, that is the glory of having a, a nice, solid foundation and all those years behind us. So um, without uh, going on too much longer, I'll go ahead and have um, Ed talk about the Pinot Noir. So if you have that in your glass now, um, a little secret, this is his favorite wine. That's why he gets to talk about it. <laughs> so I'll let him talk about our wonderful Russian River Valley Pinot Noir. Well, I always, uh, I always say when people ask me what my favorite wine is, I always tell them the wine in my glass in front of me. Uh, this happens to be the one that this time of year I find myself um, gravitating to and also sort of great end of the day, get home from work, um, pour a glass of wine and, and enjoy something. It just really fits the bill. I have a little thing that I, I feel about Pinot Noir and the number one rule for Pinot Noir is when you pour it in your glass, you ought to be able to see through it. Um, it is a delicate, beautiful grape and wine. And I, I think that I've heard people, I was actually in a, in a retail store in Colorado following another rep and I he came out and I went walked in and the buyer was shaking his head and I said what are you shaking your head and he said I just had someone in here presenting me their Pinot Noir and they referred to it as a steakhouse Pinot Noir and he, he and I were on the same page that Pinot Noir should be something that is uh, you should be able to describe like your last best date right I mean, it, it was very alluring it was attractive it's light on its feet. It, um, it has a wonderful scent. Um, when you have it a little bit on your lips, it makes you want to have a little bit more of that. And Monse just does such a beautiful job with this grape and with this wine. Jim was talking about uh, the Johnson, my mouth is watering just thinking about it. Um, Jim was talking about the Johnson Vineyard where we so source a good portion of our Chardonnay. And the, the fun history 
with the Pinot Noir that we have here at Petroncelli is originally um, the the Pinot Noir vineyard was owned by Frank the Johnson family as well. Um, it was sold a number of years ago, but when they drew the Appalachian lines in 1983, uh, Foreman Lane is the dividing line between the Russian River Valley AVA and the Dry Creek Valley AVA. And the Chardonnay we had at the beginning comes from the Dry Creek side of Foreman Lane. And if you're standing in that Chardonnay vineyard and you pick a stone up out of the vineyard, which there are lots because it's a gravelly floor of the Russian River Dry Creek confluence there, uh, you pick up a little rock, you can literally throw it across the street and that rock, if it doesn't hit your distributor friend on the way by, which I almost did one time, um, it, will, it will land uh, in the Russian River Valley. And a good portion of this Pinot Noir comes from that particular vineyard um, at the northern end of the Russian River Valley. So we're talking southernmost end of Dry Creek Valley AVA, northernmost um, end of Russian River Valley AVA. And it's just that cooler influence. We're just talking 10 miles um, south of the winery. But the difference in climate is the difference between wearing a hoodie in the morning and being in shirt sleeves. Um, it's amazing how, how the draw of the Russian River Valley and then up into the Dry Creek Valley at the south end there, the heat from the daytime in the northern Moor regions creates the uh, natural convection and, and the air rises and it sucks in that fog right up the Russian River Valley, keeps the, the air nice and cool and it'll, it'll stay foggy in, in the Healdsburg Plain there until 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. By the time you get to the winery here, uh, it's peeling off at 8.30, 9 o'clock. So it's just that little short distance, you get a huge difference in climate, which really lends itself so beautifully to this wine. I love the fact Monse really just brings out all of those wonderful Pinot Noir characteristics, a little rose petal, some nice cherry. I, I often think that, and sometimes if I think people aren't paying attention, I'll say, well, you know, Russian River Valley is actually the geographic center between Oregon and Burgundy. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then it'll dawn on them that it's nowhere near the geographic center. But I have their attention again. And, and you can actually, it may not be the geographic center, but I think it is the stylistic center between the two. You're getting in, in the Russian River Valley, you get this beautiful, bright, sometimes tart cherry, sometimes a little bit riper cherry but you're getting that wonderful earthiness that comes from, uh, comes from Burgundy. And I find that this wine changes in the glass a lot from the time you first pour it until the time you finish the glass, maybe smelling an empty glass, just as it warms up, as it aerates, some of those more um, Burgundian characteristics come through. Such a beautiful wine, bright acidity. I think, I think Monse's middle name must be bright acidity because she always, her wines always, just drive that um, mouth-watering feel. And for, you know, for us, it's driven because we're so food-oriented. That that's stylistically, that's what drives the style of the wines. That we're always looking for those brighter, um, brighter acidity and things like that. But I think for a restaurant or for a wine shop, it is actually, a, a, it's sort of something Henry Ford uh, did back in the 1900s, he, it was called planned obsolescence, right? He made a car and then he made sure that it was obsolete in about a year or two, so you go and buy the new one. I think of it this way, and that this wine kind of leaves me wanting a little bit. I taste a little bit. Get it in my mouth, I swallow it. Oh, that wonderful fruit and the earth is there. My mouth is watering. And all of a sudden, I want some more. Um, it, that mouth-watering experience is simply your brain telling your mouth, put something in me. Well, if you're a restaurant, that's great because they're going to put a little bit more food in their mouth. If you're a wine shop, that's great because they're going to consume a bottle of wine um, and they're going to want, to want to get another one. And I really think it's an important part of wine. I think for the wine experience, you, want, you don't want a satisfying beverage. You want something that inspires more um, more involvement, both with the drink and with the food and with the people around you. Um, and I think those, those mouth-watering, juicy wines really do that for you. I love, Monse, hats off to you on this wine. It's just beautiful. And, and the, the length, even with the, the bright acidity to me, while it cleans up, it doesn't leave. It, it simply 
um, the, the flavor is just, just tends to go on. So yeah, it's my favorite wine right now. It's one of my glass, but uh, I, I do love this wine. I, I find that it goes with so many of the recipes that Julie um, finds and prepares at home for our meals. Um, uh, we've been having fun during the during the lockdown. We realized that many of the recipes Julie's posted online didn't have photographs. So unfortunately, we've had to start cooking through the recipe bank on the website and photographing the food as we go. Um, so you know, here's to here's to the next twenty, right? Next twenty pounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so right. and Jim, Jim, can you remind me was was Pinot Noir one of the first variety labeled wines you did? Uh, yes, yes, Pinot was uh, one of our very first uh, that we did back in the, the 60s. We actually had it planted on our property here. I like the Chardonnay and then uh, went on to uh, uh, plant, you know, sourcing from the Russian River because it, it, even though it was a good wine at that time, it was a better wine from the Russian yeah. River Appalachian. So. So it really has been a, it's been a, bit, a major part of our mix for 50 years. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, still one of the mainstays of our, of our wine, uh, wine categories here. So uh, yeah, and it's, it's gone through a lot of changes along the, along the, the years, but uh, I think it's better for it now. All right, so thank you for that. I hope you're enjoying the Pinot Noir. It gave a great little presentation. So um, we're going to, I'm gonna move in, sip on that Pinot uh, or the other wines that you have in your glass and I'll talk a little bit about, Mitch has already introduced himself as the fourth generation and he is, he is our sole representative at this point in our family business. And uh, the, the, uh, one of the items that he was tasked with when he first came on uh, was the, um, sustainability project. Um, Sonoma County went through a, a five-year period where they wanted to become 100% sustainable by 2019. And so we had, uh, so when Mitch came along and there's a nice thick book about 200 questions or so per vineyard in the winery and he was tasked with that. So I'm going to actually ask him just to briefly kind of go over what that means to be certified sustainable um, here at Pedro County. Oh, there you go. Good. So yeah, um, that was one of my first tasks when I came uh, to the winery full time. Um, I was uh, the head of the sustainability initiative and we started, you know, it's been, yeah, four years for the winery and five years for the vineyard. So yeah, we were kind of in the beginning of, you know, as far as a, an Appalachian or a region. We were one of the first to, to, to sort of uh, dive into this and uh, figure out what it was really all about. And so uh, if you have any questions, you know, I, like I said, I'm five years into it. So I might, you know, shoot over some of the stuff that I learned in year one. So feel free to ask questions about it. But uh, really what I what I found out about the what they call the three E or the three E's of sustainability, um, being socially equitable, um, environmentally friendly, and uh, economically feasible, is really it, it differs so much for every winery or every vineyard throughout this place because everybody's everybody's got their own situation and everybody makes it work the way that they know how. And for us, it's just I mean, sort of sort of coincides with what we do here. I mean, in a lot of aspects, I mean, you know, just looking at um, the social equity equity side of it, um, you know, people love uh, our story. People love, you know, that we're a family owned and operated winery. We've been here for 93 years. I mean, and that in itself shows that we're, that we're sustaining this, this land and this business that we, that we have. And I, I think really, um, people in, in my generation, too, um, they like, you know, the authenticity of, of who we are, you know, I mean, millennials, you know, they're always looking for something that's authentic, that's real, something that's tangible that they can see, and when you see, you know, uh, my grandpa 
down the warehouse throwing an order order together or you know looking at trucks or you know this and that he's down on the floor looking at make sure everything's running right i mean people love that and i think that's something that everybody can resonate with so in that aspect that's where i think we're high we're highlighted in the whole sustainability initiative i think that's where we're really we really um we really shine but in you know everything uh i think economic uh or not economically but i think environment is another place where we're we're really um ahead of the curve as as, you know as far as other companies or other outfits in this area just because we're you know a small family owned and operated once again family owned and operated operation here um we are able you know we're our vineyards are you know overwatched by a group of six or seven guys that have been with us for 20 25 years so you can see the care in the vineyard as well as the winery and all throughout the wines as well it's just like there's a little bit more i think of a personal touch to to, to pedroncelli um you know in regards to some other you know bigger larger corporation i think that you'll really see here, there's a, a little bit more attention to detail, a little bit more care in every step of the way. So that's really the two out of the three aspects that I think. And then, you know, eco economically feasible, that one's kind of, a, you know, again, uh, we have what we need here as far as equipment, facility, everything like that, and we maintain it mostly in-house. You know, uh, we, we have our own bottling line, uh, warehouse storage, you know, cellar work, it's all done in-house. So I think that also helps us in, in the long run as well, or helps us for longevity. So. I love the, uh, the fact that, that it has to be economically feasible. It means we're not just um, doling out dollars just to have a certification. It's really, that, that to me is really, I, I think the thing that kind of sums it up to me is all of the stuff that you went through, Mitch, and uh, you know, looking and assessing us along the way. And I remember you telling us that, you know, you were sort of grading us kind of low. And when the, the, when the auditor came in, kind of had to cajole you into giving us a little bit better, uh, a little bit better scores on things. But it, it, to me, when you sit around talking about sustainability, it's great to talk about, you know, how you're lowering pesticides or how many, fewer tractor trips through the vineyard you're taking. But I think just being here today with Jim and Julie and Mitch speaks sustainability without having to write certification on the label. And it just makes me really proud of the family that has done this for 93 years. But also I love the fact that, that Mitch is our chief sustainability officer because if we're practicing sustainability, guess who it's going to benefit? It's going to benefit Mitch and his family and, and the generations to follow. So it just, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of cool. Not to mention the fact that I appreciate, we're going to take our dog for a walk out in the vineyard every day. He's going to come back into the office and he's going to lick his paws. I like knowing that his paws are good and clean when he licks them after walking walk in the vineyard. So, uh, so thanks, Man. Mitchie. <laughs> Thank, yes, thank you. I see there's a question from Teresa, hi. Um, yeah, we don't have like, we don't have sheep or goats or anything like that eating, but what, uh, through the vineyards and things like that. But uh, I know that we do have, we have preserved riparian habitats, both um, on all the properties that we have. We have, uh, we farm um, 105 acres of vineyard, over 180 acres here on uh, the home ranch, the east side vineyards and the wisdom vineyard. And each of them contain um, this wonderful habitat that is uh, that works just alongside of our vineyard. Um, so you'll often see hawks and deer. I know deer are kind of the bane. Pigs, I hear, are a thing these days. So, uh, but all of that uh, factors into the fact that uh, they they just kind of roam where they roam. And I I hope that that answers your question. And also a question about automated. We hand pick most of our vineyard, although um, we have started to machine harvest because of the difficulties of labor um, down um, on the east side vineyards. Some of our Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignon Blancs are machine harvested. Mitch, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that about right? Yeah, so yeah. that's, uh, we do one block of Sauvignon Blanc and then we do two blocks of Cabernet. 
Um, that's the only stuff that gets machined uh, just because it's, uh, you know, for what, what we are or where we're at here, you know, it's definitely on the home ranch, it's going to be always, you know, handcrafted um, through the vineyard hand work. Uh, it's hillside, you know, you can't, you, you can't really be automated on these hillsides. There's just no equipment that exists like that. And uh, I think it kind of sort of takes away from this history that we have here. And um, the way we kind of uh, think about, you know, the animals uh, leading to more sustainable, you know, like no-till and whatnot like that. That's always, it's always been an, an idea and it's something that it may be in the future. Um, right now, the way that our properties are, um, you know, spread out throughout the Dry Creek Valley here, uh, especially on the home ranch, it goes through, um, a, there was a, well, there's a county road that splits the two properties right now. So in order for us to be able to, you know, fence the fence the animals from keep them from roaming to other properties and stuff like that, that would be our biggest issue is trying to figure out a way where you know it's well keeping these animals somewhat in the country and not just having them roam and and keeping the animals safe from the animals that roam. I mean that's everybody you know we're talking about um, or. or are there animals or are animals a part of the process? And Julie mentioned the riparian reserves. You know, it's everybody loves to talk about wildlife, but nobody likes to talk about wild death. And part of having the, the riparian reserves is it's a great place for hawks to live, bobcats in the area. We have mountain lion that comes through once in a while. And those are natural predators that take care of some of the natural pests in the vineyard, being deer or pigs or rabbits or gophers or things like that. And it's interesting to me that by having that extra land that is still oak trees and canyons and poison oak, um, that it gives, a, it gives a place for these animals to live. And that natural cycle of life is all a part. It, it just sort of happens in the middle of our vineyard. Um, and it, it benefits our vineyard in that those things that would eat grape shoots or grape bunches um, have some natural predators out there. So while we're not bringing goats or sheep in, we are making sure that we provide for the natural predators to have the space as well. And I think that's an important part of sustainability. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I think that's a nice in-depth look at the sustainable practices we have here. Um, so I'm going to move on just recently, um, just so you know how the uh, ownership has rolled over the years, uh, starting with my grandparents, going to my father, my uncle, and uh, recently the transfer of ownership went to um, uh, many of the third and fourth generation members of the family. We became a 70% women-owned winery. And on top of that, uh, our winemaker, Monsley Reese, who has been with us first as an assistant winemaker in 2007, and she became winemaker in 2015 when my uncle John passed. And uh, she always loves to talk about uh, what a wonderful experience she had working for um, an icon because John basically uh, made wine for over 60 vintages and really set our house style. But Monse has been able to really bring, bring that house style in, and bring it into her own. So as you taste the Mother Clone Simhadel, which she is going to talk about next, um, I'll just briefly say Mother Clone, the term really just refers to um, our old, uh, old excuse me, the 33 acres of Simhadel that we have here on the home ranch, which actually spans three generations. The original, uh, over 100 years old, all part of the mix. Uh, the 40-year-old vines that are the second generation, and then I think we have about a six-year-old vineyard uh, that is the most latest planting of Simhadel on the property. So. Um, Monse, do you mind kicking in? Thank you. So, hi. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. My, the 2018 uh, Sinfandel Mother Clone is the wine, the wine that you guys, I hope you have with you. It's a wonderful vintage. I think it's, uh, in my opinion, and this is my personal opinion, I think it's one of the best vintages so far. That we're having here is uh, the reason is because the weather was just perfect everything happened at the right time and the right in the right way um the way i i focus the making of this wine is always focusing on the acidity uh Sinfandel is a very uneven grape that tends to be very high in alcohol and very high in sugars 
So what I try to do in the picking time is look at the pH only. Basically, that's my guideline for the, the right time to pick up the Zinfandel for the mother clone and the other Zinfandels that we make too. Um, one of the major challenges for the mother clone for me is um, the unevenness of the grape, but also the unevenness of the lots. We have many lots, little, small lots that come to the mother clone to make the mother clone. And many of those, uh, they ripe at different times and they got the developed different times of the, uh, during the harvest time. And many times a, full, a whole lot gets picked at different times in maybe three times. We have to go three times to pass that lot to get it all at the time, at the acidity and sugars that we look, where we're looking at it. Um, Mother clone also has a percentage of petit sira in it. It has a 10%. It's very, it's always the same, more or less, during uh, every vintage. And the reason for that is historic. And basically, that's the way uh, in Sonoma County, uh, Sinfandels were made. So this is very much an old school Sinfandel. I uh, continue that tradition. But also, uh, Petit Sira gives a uh, backbone to the Sinfandel. Sinfandel is no big in tannins. And that little percentage of Petit Sira builds up the wine. As aging goes, I like to use American oak only, but I will only use about 30%, no more than that, 30% new American oak aging for about 12 months, no more than that either. Uh, that keeps more of the freshness of the fruit. If you age too longer, you get more of the oak, but less, you're, you're, you're losing the fruit. I think this, uh, this style of Sinfandel has to show uh, the fruit and the characteristics of uh, the fruit from Dry Creek that also includes the spiciness. That is something very unique from that area that you cannot find in other Sinfandels. And, um, and the oak is just there to build up the complexity of the wine without overpowering. This is uh, trying to show the variety and trying to show the place. Sinfandels from Dry Creek are very specific uh, taste-wise and aromatic-wise. They're, they're, they're really different from other uh, Sinfandels. And I think the Mother Clone achieves that as well as the other single vineyards that we have. But this one is, uh, in my opinion, the, the soul of this winery. This wine is Pedroncelli. It really is a picture of what this uh, winery and this family is about. And I hope you enjoy it. And please, if you have any questions about any wine making technique that you came out that you need to know, just let me know. But basically, that will be what uh, Mother Clone it is. And remember, 2018, really, really good vintage. <laughs> Monse, could you, um, you've, I've heard you say that, um, that Zinfandel tells the story of a vintage. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? From all the wines that we made here, I believe, and the, again, this is my personal opinion, uh, the Zinfandel tells the story of the vintage. It, it shows how the vintage was better than other wines. I will say, if you check mother clones from different vintage, they taste different mm -hmm. because it really ha was how that wine was grown. The growing season was that year. If it was high heat spikes, it gets reflected in the wine. If it was a cold weather, weather uh, growing season, it gets reflected in the wine and so on. And you have wines like Cabernet that they're very resilient and they hit, they hold the heat spikes very well and they don't get, you don't see so many, so much change as you see in these wines. So every vintage from the mother clone and any Zinfandel from, in, for that matter, will Will, it will be slightly different and will tell you how it was that year. And that's why I always say that the Mother Clone uh, tells the story of the vintage. It tells you that in this particular case, the 2018 was a perfect vintage weather-wise. We didn't have heat spikes. We didn't have rains for a month. It was just everything matured on time and timely. And, and it, the grapes had their time to get their things and all their flavors together without any hurry up. We didn't need to hurry to pick up like we do in other vintages. So it's just 
my personal opinion on this wine in particular. So you've, oh, go ahead, Mitch. Uh, in other words, and in, in coming from my side of the story is, Zinfandel's a finicky grape, <laughs> and it's it hard is. to grow sometimes. <laughs> it can it really turn on you quick. So, Monse, I've heard you also um, say that we don't make fruit farms. What, what is the, what's behind that? Well, like I said before, I base the picking times on the Zinfandels on the acidity, not the sugars. I believe if you base your picking times in the sugars, even you have to look at it, um, you will end up with a very ripe, overripe Zinfandels and the ripest the Zinfandel get, the more of uh, varietal flavors you lose and it gets more ripening. Uh, when you base your picking times on the pH and the acidity, when you get there, uh, you get all the spices, all the herbs, uh, cooking herbs, cinnamon, um, baking, baking herbs that I say, and the spices, peppers, white pepper that you can find in this wine. And that's why this is more a spice bomb than a fruit bomb. A fruit bomb will be a wine that we will hang on the vines for a long time. And yes, you will have a bigger body wine, you will have a very dark wine, but you will have lost all those varietal flavors that are natural from the grape. And you only have it if you pick based on the acidity and not on the sugars. So this is pretty spicy wine. It is, it, like I said, 2018, keep that in mind, it's really good. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you have all enjoyed our wines. I'm going to leave you with this one thought. Um, a couple of months ago, I ran across a, a Facebook post because, hey, I'm a boomer. And uh, I found a fellow who talked about what they did with their, uh, when they picked out a bottle of wine from their cellar to have with dinner. So I want you all to keep this in mind. And the next time you have a bottle, look at the vintage. Think about the vintage, think about what happened that particular year. Did a baby get born? Did somebody get married? For us, 2018 is a wonderful, wonderful year. Um, actually, 2019 is, whoops, excuse me, Sauvignon Blanc. Our daughter got married in 2019. And, you know, things like that. But uh, I'll just leave you with that because you've heard our story. We're family. We're here in Dry Creek Valley. We're here to stay. Uh, through the generations and we certainly hope that you've enjoyed this time and when you pick up a bottle of Petroncelli and look at the vintage Reflect and that's all we ask enjoy the wine reflect on your life and um, Just enjoy so cheers to all of you. I don't have any wine left But cheers and sure, of course uh, for you. But yeah, <laughs> thanks dear. So anyway, Joe What do you think you have any questions? Oh, you're muted. I hate when that happens. I don't have any questions <laughs> in the uh, chat, but uh, feel free, please, to uh, unmute yourself and uh, and uh, use your uh, questions. I think we have a couple thank yous uh, okay. in there, but uh, I have to just say it's it's just great to see multi generations uh, in a Zoom meeting, and uh, my, during the meeting, of course, inundated with uh, calls from my uh, two of our generations, my brother and Matt and my brother Matthew uh, and uh, and my dad. There goes another one. Uh, but both of them say hi to the Pedrincelli family. And uh, I just love uh, what you guys do, and that you're, you know, for a very long time in California and in the wine world, uh, everyone went to you know one end of the pendulum to the other. And the uh, idea of making these powerhouse big fruit bombs, uh, especially in Zinfandel. But I mean, even in Pinot Noir and in Cabernet, and I've always loved the fact that you guys have stuck to your, you know, knowledge and, and passion for what you guys do well in, in, in well-articulated, uh, complex, really amazing value wines. Uh, and I applaud uh, all three generations. Uh, fantastic. And thank you. Thank cheers. you. Cheers. 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 So uh, Julie didn't ask Joe to, to tell about the station wagon ride uh, up Canyon Road. <laughs> Is that urban legend or? Which you... one? I mean, there were so many. <laughs> but uh, I, I, are you referring to my nine siblings and I uh, heading out to California? <laughs> yes. <laughs>
Yes, my before uh, seatbelts were a law. Yeah. My, uh, my saints of parents, Helen and Joe, uh, took uh, all nine, ten kids, uh, and a babysitter uh, from Chicago over to the uh, Washington State, and then dropped down uh, through Oregon and into uh, California. And we stayed in California, I think, for almost a week. And if anybody remembers Robbie Benson, uh, way old, forever ago, teen bop guy. Yeah. He was at the same hotel as we were in Napa. Ooh. And uh, he was a, a TV show. I forget what the TV show. My sister, Susie, would, was like tripping over her tongue about yeah. uh, talking to Robbie Benson. And they had this huge RV. And it was he and his parents. And he said, oh, no, we came in that station wagon. <laughs> And his jaw just dropped like what and i think they were just coming up from la wow <laughs> great story that along about the time uh, the pattern shelly and glenn's came together yeah oh no it had to have been earlier than that i think that uh yeah. pattern shelly and glenn started selling in the late early 60s or early 70s yeah i think yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, I mean, most of the kids weren't born until well into the 90s. 90s, that's right. I, <laughs> excuse me for, of course, silly me. Oh, that's all good. It's all good. So what does the cl uh, Mother Clone retail for? $19. $19. All right. And then um, will you have any materials to share from this? Uh, yes, uh, Liz, we will get you... Uh, uh, all of the information. I'm almost positive when you signed up, you gave us, uh, you signed up with your email address. If not, we'll have your sales rep reach out to you and we'll get uh, all that. Also, just so everybody knows, this fabulous uh, conversation with uh, three generations of the Petter and Shelley family has been recorded and will be up on the uh, YouTube, Glenn's YouTube channel. Uh, I, I never thought I'd say those words together, but we have it. <laughs> And uh, we will be happy to uh, continue to share samples and, and toast this uh, great meeting. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have Cheers. a great Cheers. 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 Joe. The glances. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. We'll do it again. Without a doubt. Very soon. Back to your bedroom. <laughs> okay. yeah. right. Next time. See you later. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Okay. All right, guys. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. It was great. Thank you. It was wonderful for the opportunity. Thank you. Mary, thanks for coming. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Mr. Sellies. You guys are great. Good to see you, bud. Thanks.